Greetings, friends, and welcome to Learning Never Stops by TutorOcean.com. Today's guest is Kenji Wang, a young tutor who teaches coding on TutorOcean. He can teach you CSS, HTML, JavaScript, game development, and much more. He's a passionate teacher and someone who you really want to learn from. Enjoy this interview. For you know somebody watching who wants to get involved in programming, if you had to start again, what programming language would you learn first? I do encourage starting with Scratch, and it's because it's very simple language to start off in the beginning. It's very controversial if you can't Scratch a language. It's more of playground. And for the viewers who don't know, Scratch is a kind of gooey visual puzzle that each block represents a logic. And so you can click the blocks together and effectively make a program or algorithm. Whenever I teach, I always say, think of coding like English, say the logic out loud. In the beginning, when I didn't know any syntax like JavaScript or Python or all these different languages, just having blocks so I can see all the syntax and then I can just lay it out. It allows you to cultivate the logic first and then afterwards you can move on to JavaScript and then you can just learn from there. Yeah, that's a great answer. I think that is what they do at the college level. What was the actual first pr programming language you learned though? I think it was JS. So th there was this weird thing I used to go to when I was younger, where basically every week you can go here and then you can just learn something. Code. The first time I ever attempted coding myself was there was just this meeting. It was just like a tutorial of just a simple clicker game. And that's the first time I ever attempted coding. And yeah, so I did start off with Scratch. And in that experience, I remember to this day because they like hand fed you what the code is and they just told you, yeah, do this, do that. They didn't really give you any like space to actually add your own touch to it. So just as a joke, I just changed some numbers here and there to make the clicker really weird and stuff. Yeah, it sounds like fun is a part of learning for you. It sounded like you had to change the specifications to make it interesting. Right? Yeah, fun is a very important thing in education because why do you want to keep on learning if you find it boring? I do think that actually playing video games was very important for coding. Of course, you're not into, if you're not into video games, you can still learn coding, but it gives you an extra motivation to learn because you know that if you can learn this, if you can learn, that'll make you one step closer to be able to make your own video game. When I started learning out coding, like my brother and I code all the time together. To this day, we still code all the time together. And one of our first projects, the one of the first things that we did like by ourselves, no like random person to help or anything was making a game. It's really important to always have a fun element. It gives you a drive to keep on pushing forward. That's great. And what language did you code that game in? Was it Scratch? I don't think you can make a game with Scratch. Yeah, originally that game was Scratch. So basically in every single language, you can make games, which is very interesting. Even the ones where it's built for like, it's built for backend, it's built for websites, it's built for whatever, you can still make games in those. So a programming language doesn't matter so much. But what kind of game was it? In 2015, there was this really big meme. It recently got a big spike in popularity again. The Doge. It was a coin and it exploded. But before that, there was just the Doge image. And Kayla and I just made a joke because it's just like mining Doge coin. So we basically just made a very just simple game where you can mine Doge coin and then you can buy Shiba Inus to mine for you too. And that was the first game I ever made. Wow. Shibu Inu is such a legendary dog now. And I wish I was playing your game. <laughs> Great. Kids learning to code is a hot topic these days. And a lot of parents are listening and wondering how do they get their kids interested to learn. Do you have any advice to give to our like parent listeners? Yeah, I think it's mostly a concept called... Uh... PLP. It's an educational concept. PLP stands for personal learning pathway. There are multiple meanings. That's the one I learned. And in personal learning pathway, they, the child themselves get to choose what to like, what they want in the end. So every, everybody says this, if you want to learn, it's better to learn through project making than through just like randomly just learning for learning's sake. And PLP allows the person to choose a project they're passionate in. If I'm a random person, the PLP to learn coding, the PI I want to do is make a platformer similar to Mario, right? Mm. 
if that's my PLP, then I have a motivation to research by myself what I need to make that game. I'd figure out, oh, I need a game engine. Oh, Unity is a popular game engine. Oh, I need variables to store my momentum. And you can learn one by one. First, by setting a PLP, setting a project you're passionate in, and then you can go step by step learning all the things you need to reach that goal. Yeah, that's a very interesting approach, a project-based approach. Would it be appropriate for the parents to get involved or you think that this should be on the kids own volition i believe that it's up to the kids right like a majority of, like i think at least 90 percent of all the code i know was self-taught but the few things that i've learned that was taught by somebody else there's this guy in the middle school i went to rolando and another guy mitch Meja. They all helped me. They introduced new concepts to me. It's, you've been coding this whole time, but there's this whole other dimension, right? Like you can add this, you can do this. I think it's mostly a matter of guiding the child. It's very important for coders to specifically be able to figure out problems by themselves. If you spoon feed them like answers, do you have to do this? You have to do that. They're not coding. They're just following instructions. So I do believe that mostly it should be by the child, but the parents can be there to guide them. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that's very important. I think we've got to find the answers ourselves and that may be doing a Google search to figure out what's the error mean. I think this like coding is the only subject where a teacher will specifically encourage you to search it up on Google. What teacher is just, you're stuck on this question, in a math question? Oh, don't worry, just search it up on Google during your exam. No, this is your chance for whoever wants their coding, you can do it, so. Yes, it's almost like the tenacity or willing willingness to accomplish the project and goal is what's important. Then you get stuck, no big deal, just Google it you'll get unstuck eventually. And that's how learning done, as you say. So the great answer. What is one of your favorite resources for learning to code? There are three. The first one, this is the best resource for beginner learners. It's called W3Schools, where you can learn HTML, CSS, JS. Those three languages build websites. The second one is Mozilla Web Docs. It's really easy to move around and everything. And it's for more technical people. Use MDN to learn deeper into what each thing means. What does this command mean? Why does it work? What does this tag mean? Why does it function that way? What does the name mean? The third and final one, it's just looking at documentation. For example, if you want to learn a specific thing, oh, I want to learn this language, Rust. Then you look at the documentation. The creator of Rust will obviously know the most about their language. So if they make a big doc about how to use it and everything, it's one of the best resources. So, yeah. Well, that's great. So three, three great resources. I was curious, have you had a tutor in coding or a mentor? Yeah, the two I named before, Rolando and Mr. Meja, those were at one point my two. So Rolando, I don't even know. So basically, I used to go to this school called Ad Astra. And at the end of the year, you have to do this big project. In this point of time, I was only affiliated with the school. I wasn't like, I was just like the brother of, of one of the students in the school. And she, my sister, she was in the school. And in the end of the year, she needs to make a symposium. And basically in the symposium, you have to... You have to make a big project, present to everyone, even like big people will be there. All the parents, obviously, but also like really big entrepreneurs will be there. And so it has to be good. And my sister chose to make hers about a site that we made called Big Ben. And during that time between the hackathon win and the symposium, we were like, hey, let's improve this. So we still have a lot of time. Let's improve this. So we just got we got this guy, Rolando, who introduced to me a lot of new things about coding. Like he showed me that there's more than just front end in coding. There's also a back section where all the servers are, where all the fat stuff is. So Rolando helped me in that. Mr. Meja too. He taught, he introduced to me Node.js, which was like to this day, the premier like back end language. So yeah. That's great. And if somebody didn't have a, teacher would you recommend that they grab a tutor of quality from tutorocean.com i think so i know this really great tutor can you if you want to get him then like you can if you want that's great that's really nice to hear that anyone can go on the internet and just 
grab a great tutor. Thanks. So I got another question. You mentioned Ad Astra. Can you maybe explain, because I think some viewers are interested, Ad Astra in Latin means to the stars. So can you explain a little bit about your experience there? Yeah. So basically Ad Astra is a really interesting school. So it was when in its inception, I think it was 2014. Um, it was basically the school that Elon Musk started for his children, because if you don't know, he has a set of twins and triplets. Wow, that's a lot of children. But he wanted to give a quality school of education for them. So this guy, Mr. Don, and he told him to make the best school you can. And he just gave a bunch of funding to Mr. Don. And he's, and Mr. Don with Elon Musk basically just made Ad Astra. And it's more than just a random private school funded by Elon Musk. It actually does have some stuff that is, I find really interesting and I think should be applied to modern schools. There's this thing that Mr. Don made called synthesis and you can, and synthesis is still out there. Do you remember how I said that you, to learn, you need to have fun, right? He basically made this thing where they teach you logic. They teach you how to crunch numbers in real life. Like pre-calculus and calculus aren't used as much. So specifically synthesis was made to teach you how to crunch numbers in the re in the real world like in business right he made a bunch of games my favorite being a4a where you have to crunch numbers there are a bunch of teams and you have to just try to be the best in the game for example as i said before the game a4a is basically about making the biggest like art museum you can making the most money off of the art museum and when i started a4a i was really bad at this like in the first day in the simulation, I was $100 million in debt. <laughs> and by the end, because I was just learning and I was just talking and everything, right? By the end, I was second place out of all the teams. And it was just like re really great learning experience. So yeah, there was synthesis. And the and Astra is a cool school in my opinion. And can you compare and contrast that with public education or are you in a public school or a private school where are you at now so it's really interesting because over the years i've went to every single type of school i went to a public school from elementary school and technically i'm in a public school right now i've been to private schools like i think two or three of them i went home school i went micro schools in the entire school there was only 20 people it's a micro school yeah so at Astra compared to the average public school, right? It was a lot smaller when I was first, like when I first heard of it and when I first saw it, there was only 50, no, there was only 40 students and everybody was close. There, it was a really interesting place. And yeah, it's a lot smaller, the classes. The teachers are very good, in my opinion. There's Mr. Don, there's Mr. Lackis, there's Dr. Rose, and they were like Mrs. Safranoff. They're like really good teachers. And so the thing is a lot more high quality. And I like the class sizes are smaller. They teach, they teach like robotics. They teach synthesis, as I, say, as I said before. There was this class A frame where every single week they gave you make a windmill and or make like uh, a hydro mill, windmill. There's a bunch of different challenges they do in A-frame. And they basically just let the entire school just go to this in the, basically the school's yard. There's a bunch of PVC by pipes. There's hot glue, there's cardboard, there's steel. You can basically just put whatever you want together and make your own things in A-frame, which I found really cool. Wow. Wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. Make math fun again make coding fun again. Can we talk about a little bit about coding competitions? I've never been in one. I don't imagine our <laughs> listeners have ever been in one either. I understand that you've done a lot and competed in them and won a lot of them. Is this something that you think other people can get involved in? Yeah, so basically for coding competitions, they're called hackathons. All The name's quite misleading. You don't actually hack in hackathons. Instead, you make your own projects, not break other people. So in hackathons, they're basically just make the coolest project. It can be whatever you want. Make the coolest project you can in, I don't know, like three days, two days. And in that time frame, you in that time frame, you get to just make whatever you want, make teams. And in the last like 
when it comes to when it comes to these, like o- awards, there are a bunch of different categories, like the best overall or the best education hack, the best environmental hack, the best justice hack. And after that, it's just like you try to just win as many as possible. In one coding competition, I once won two in like best like best below college hack. What's it called? Pre-collegiate hack and best education hack. And sorry, best genomics hack. So best genomics hack and best pre-collegiate hack. And it's a really fun experience. You don't even need to be good at coding to enter a coding competition. The first one I ever went to, I lost. It was when I had a lot of fun and I learned a lot of things. To go into hackathon isn't to prove that you're good at coding. You go to hackathons to learn. And that's a really interesting approach. You go to the competitions not to win, but to learn. And it's a really great learning experience going to hackathons. Well, that's great. So would you recommend that? I, I don't I don't think it would be a great idea to get parents to force their kids into hackathons. But but how would you su- suggest that a kid, a parent, like nudge their parents in that direction? The easiest way is just like, just bring in a bunch of friends. If the kid has friends, bring some friends in and in one hour or in 15 minutes, like completely tiny amounts of time. Make the coolest project you can, go, and then you can just wait. And then when the one hour or 15 minutes is over, you can see it. And then you can start going bigger, two hours and three hours, then one day, then two days, then three days, then not even like just your family's hackathon. Then try going to a real hackathon. It's really just stepping all the way up. Cool. And if a kid out there wanted to get tutoring from you what would one of those like tutoring sessions look like so basically mostly for me i first of all try to gauge how good they are once i understand they're this good they might not know any for example let's say there's this random student they don't know any syntax in coding languages they don't know any syntax they don't know any coding languages but they have a really strong logic then from there i just think when the meeting is over then i just think about to myself it's just like what should I do next? Like, how should I teach? So for the rest of the week, I just think about what I can do. And then when we meet again, then I basically just, first of all, I explain like how it's going to work. Then I start off by first off walking them through a project. And then afterwards I let them customize it. Usually like I just gained this approach like a few weeks ago, but then I let them customize it however they want. And Every once in a while, I'll just test them. It's just, I first code this massive, big thing. Then I, and then I'm just like, do you know what this line means? Or it's just, for example, I'll just make a login signup system. It's like, do you know what this line means? And if they don't know, they just search it up. I encourage them to be as independent as possible. I'm mostly, I try to be there to mostly, if they're absolutely stuck, then they try calling me out because it's very important to learn independently in coding. It's very really important to learn to find resources. And it doesn't only apply to coding. Like being able to find resources in real life is also really important. So yeah. You sound very passionate about teaching. Is tutoring something you enjoy? Oh, I really enjoy it. Tutor Ocean is like, it's a, it's one of a long list of things I've done. I love teaching. I don't even know why. In literally just this school year, I made like this whole school club where, and I made the incentive so that at the end of the year, you should be able to make a game. And I led two classes in that club, the full stack web dev class and the game dev class. And then there's Tutor Ocean. I just tutor a bunch of people on Tutor Ocean. And then the latest one in this list of things was this like smaller thing I made called Cadmium with my brother, where basically for the kids in the neighborhood who wants to learn every like other Saturday, we just get together and we code, then we'll just have a game tournament or something, or we'll have a long discussion about like cryptocurrency or something. Yeah. Cool. That's an exciting project. I, are you working on any other exciting projects? Yeah. Every once in a while, I just have an epiphany of what do I want to do? In 2020, I made a decade year resolution. And my goal was to make a project so good that when I reach college, like colleges just see, oh, Kenji made this, they're going to accept it. So because of that, like decade long res- years resolution, new decade resolution, I'll just call it that because of the new decade, I basically just like 
started making a bunch of new big projects. One of them is an education project where basically the goal is to not only gamify education, but also to promote private education. I do believe strongly that private education is a really good step forward in the education sector. Another project that I made is to specifically promote innovation and capitalism for younger students by making a simulation of the stock market where they can create their own stores and where there's and where other people can buy products from them and everything and one more just one more to cap it off just ended here is a project i'm working also again with my brother this time soka which is basically a chat app specifically built to cater to everyone not only like gamers for discord or like workers for slack it's just built to literally cover everyone and be the best at everything and which sounds impossible but like Kaz and I just like set up this whole system to be able to do that. Around the age of five, you actually had some learning challenges. Could you expand on that? Yeah. So like when I was younger, I actually had a hard time, which was actually funny because my my father has, I'm obviously I'm not going to say IQs in the family. That's just weird. But my father had an above average IQ. My mother is super smart, like crazy smart. My sister was already able to write at three years old and everything like crazy. But this one I, we started off, not, I'm not going to say that. We started off mentally challenged and especially me, I was speech impediment. I was only able to say the alphabet until I was five years old. I was only able to spell my name when I was six years old. It was a tough time. Like I once just found a clip of me just saying like, Oh, we're going to the Fontana house, a random, like a random phrase. We're going to the Fontana house. And I just listened to it. And it's so hard to understand what I'm saying. It's like really bad in the beginning. But what got me, like what brought me higher was basically just reading. I love reading. I, to this day, I still like, if I went downstairs in my bedroom, there's a massive shelf, like four, four layers. And two of those shelves are reserved for books and they're still being overflowed. Like some of the books just can't fit in that, like in, in that shelf because Kays and I read a lot of books. Like I've read, I read Steve, like the Steve Jobs biography. I read, I'm currently reading the John D. Rockefeller biography. I read a lot of fiction, of course. I mean, what kid doesn't? <laughs> like Harry Potter, Percy Jackson, Septimus Heap. It's just all these different things. So yeah. I love that. But what are your favorite books? So I have three main categories, right? My favorite nonfiction book, my favorite healer book. My favorite series is Harry Potter. And that might be very generic, but I've read so many series by now. I've read a lot. And I don't know, Harry Potter does deserve its fame. It is crazy good, in my opinion. And my favorite, my favorite singular book is The Book Thief. It's a very good book. And it's great because you can read it when you're like 10 years old. It's a pretty long read if you're 10 years old, but you can read it when you're 10 years old. And I think it'll still be like possible to read all the way till when you're like 90, 80. It's a really good book. And it's about a character, Lysel Minger, who in World War II, where she hides a Jew in her basement. And it's a really, it's a really good book. And my favorite nonfiction book, I said it before, the Steve Jobs biography. It's a really interesting life because obviously... A person like me in tech, I look up to Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. When you think of idols, you think of them to be perfect beings who like always have the answer to everything, who are so wise and smart. But when Steve Jobs was younger, he was actually like crazy. He played a bunch of pranks. He like took drugs. Like he was a crazy person. And so reading, like trans seeing the transformations, it's a really great read. Interesting. So you, you like biographies of, of interesting people. Uh, Steve Jobs, obviously, he's changed the world. And then about the Harry Potter, what is it about Harry Potter that really grabs your interest? Yeah, so basically the thing about Harry Potter, one thing to know about me, about me I'm a very analytical reader. Sometimes it's there's a common joke in school, in the school, in, like between like for kids, there's a common joke that a writing teacher is or a drama class teacher sometimes over analyzes. It's like the red in this like carpet means this and everything. Sometimes it's just dumb how much they 
analyze and that's actually me like i analyze so so deep into like books and movies like when i watch a movie i only like it if there's three hidden layers below the like below the surface and in in harry potter i find that it's there you can read it surface level but also you realize that it's not a book about magic it's a book about friendship and below that it's not a book about friendship it's a book about family love and below that and everything about that and it's just so many layers and just such an interesting read on the surface level it's a great read and a bunch of kids love it on the deeper levels there's still a lot to analyze so you can read it again and you can realize everything also it's just such a long series that if you start reading it again you might forget some details so when you reach it again it's really rewarding oh yeah this is so cool and everything agreed so it sounds like it's just really well written a lot to understand and it's long so you get tons of enjoyment out of it do you think a kid could just walk into any library and just browse around, pick up a book. How do you read books? Do you read a physical copy or something else on a device? I usually read physical copies. If like I only, I usually really only read it if it's like a normal, just online copy. If it was, if for example, I'm just not able to find the dictionary. I don't know why. I just find joy just reading a book like in physical, in the physical copy. Just, I don't know, sitting on bed, turning on the lamp just reading. I'd sometimes read till 3 a.m. I once finished an entire book in one sitting, like an entire 300 page book in one sitting because I read till 5 a.m. <laughs> and it's any, it really just takes the way I find books for sometimes I search online. It's just like best fiction book or best nonfiction book. Sometimes it's sometimes usually though, it's, I was offered to it. It's just like my school was just in the book club it was just like, oh, we're going to be analyzing Clara and the Sun. I didn't go to the book club at that time because I was focusing mostly on coding at the time. But I just read it anyways over the summer. And man, that book is good. So like, <laughs> it's mostly just picking up on like what other people say. And I was just like, oh, read this book. I heard Bill Gates really likes this book. So, okay, so I read it. Or it's just, uh, as I said again, the school is just like, oh, we're going to read this. I wasn't in it. But I was like, okay, I'll just read it. So it's mostly just picking up from what other people suggested were good books. Very cool. Uh, do you have any other interests besides, I mean, coding, books, reading? Do you have any other interests? Yeah, so there are the three circles of my life. Coding, reading, and of course, because I'm a 13-year-old boy, gaming. Now, here's the interesting thing about gaming. In my opinion, video games contribute a lot to a kid. Not only it's just like, it makes them happy or something, or... I really do believe it helps them learn. Now, the example I'll give is the game I currently, my favorite game of all time, Super Smash Bros. Melee. The reason why it's my favorite is because although it's super accessible to gamers in the beginning, like even people who've never touched a a controller can play, can pick up Super Smash Bros. Melee. Like even at the top level where there's $10,000 on the stake and it's just, you need to be really good at the game. And it's all about that stuff. It has a super low floor where you can start off and a super high ceiling where no matter how good you are, there's always something to learn. It's an endlessly deep game. I find that interesting because it's all about, it's all down to perseverance, right? If you're in a specific section in the book that you don't particularly enjoy, but you remember that the next section is going to be crazy good. Or if you're just in the part of the biography where it's the childhood and you're just waiting for him to, I don't know, start the company or become a great politician or something, just waiting for that moment to come. It games, like I do believe that games has given me the resilience to go through the boring parts and reach the hard part a lot. I've been, I've been playing the game and I still think that to this, like I started off completely terrible at the game completely terrible i went to the online mode i got smoked it wasn't even close but now today like after two years of grinding after two years of grinding i'm now like better than the average player and it's really rewarding and it shows that all the games we play it shows that resilience is really important to learning going through hardships is actually very important before you can actually be good at something Yeah, I definitely see that with these competitive video games these days. I was wondering, do you consider it a sport? We say gaming, but do you consider like video games a sport? And do you think it'll be a part of the Olympics or something? 
I don't think it'll ever be part of the Olympics, but I do believe it is a sport. And just to like to put it shortly, I made a whole one thousand letter sorry one thousand word essay about it. So I'm very passionate about this, but I'm just going to I'm going to put it very shortly by just mentioning just one example of where games truly shine as a sport. So in my definition of a sport, it needs to have a psychological aspect and a physical aspect. Now, a sport like basketball has a great physical aspect, and the coach covers the psychological aspect. Same with soccer. Same with baseball. Baseball is very psychological for people who don't know. It actually there's a lot of psychology in, in baseball. But if we look at games, I'll point out a specific game moment that I really enjoyed. It's called Evo Moment 37. And in Evo Moment 37, there are two players, Daigo and Justin Wong. Daigo is to this day known as the greatest fighting game player of all time. And he's just absolutely insane. He won two of the biggest tournaments straight right in a row in two years in a row. And then there's Jay Wong, who because then there's Jay Wong. And he's the he's a really good US player, but he's not the best. He can't match. He, he can't match Daigo. He's not a match. But because of the psychological aspect, he thought of a really good strategy that was specifically tailored to stop Daigo. And he was able to bring it down to like last game where it all comes down to this. And now here comes the here comes the physical aspect. Now this is where everybody overlooks games like a gamer is super skinny. Look at my arm. A gamer is super skinny. Or like there, it doesn't take a lot of physical like dexterity. In the case of Evil Moment 37, Daigo had to do 20 three frame inputs. And three frames is 1 20th of a second. 20 1 30th of a second inputs in a row over the span of four seconds. There's a massive crowd behind him. There's a big risk of losing the money pot. And if he fails this input, he's going to lose. He's going to lose all the money. He's going to lose some of his fans. He has a lot to lose. And with all this pressure, he was actually able to land the, the 20, 120th frame inputs in a row and was able to combo Jay Wong to the end. So in my opinion, that phys- like it, people actually thought it was physically impossible to do that input because no human is that precise. But it was shown to be that humans were that precise. So it actually pushes the physical boundaries and the mental boundaries, in my opinion. Wow, that's fascinating. And uh, obviously, this competitor has done a lot of practice. What is it? Like Street Fighter? Yeah, it was Street Fighter 3 in that case. Yeah, and so he's done a lot of practice. And do you think that's the key to success, like in coding, school, video games, and beyond? Yeah. In my opinion, and this comes all the way comes down back to, to the argument of nature versus nurture. In my opinion, it's completely nurture. It's you have to train to be good at something. I bet look at me today. I'm able to code. I'm able to read. I'm able to write. I'm able to do math. I'm doing pre-calc and I'm doing I just finished pre-calculus literally yesterday because finals literally today because finals just ended today. But I'm able like. And in my opinion, as at five years old, I was not able to do any of those things. I was in fact behind, like I was behind in everything. And today I'm four years ahead of the math, like in math progression next to the average student my age, I think three to f- three or four years. And I do think it all comes down to nurture because I worked hard. I read from 2.45 all the way to 3 a.m. for days in a row because I grinded so hard. Kids... Kids' attention spans are so short now, right? The average goldfish's attention span is three seconds. There's a study that shows that the average kid's Gen Z attention span is even shorter. It's if you're able to put the time and effort, I do believe that you can be the best at anything you do. And have fun while at it. Yeah. So that's great. I think this is great. Uh, Thank you so much. That was a real bombshell at the end. I think you summarized it beautifully. Are you accepting students this summer so if any parents are listening to this would you be able to help them out with, uh, with their coding or many any other subjects that you can help them out with yeah i can't help them out in coding i would be open to tutoring i'm though it might i might be like 
I'm not completely sure like at this moment. Right now, I do believe I'll be very open because I've literally just applied for eight, like f- for eight jobs in coding. Like I just literally just a week ago, I just applied for a bunch of different jobs. So maybe my summer will be full, but I do believe that there's a big chance that I'll have a lot of time for a tutor. But yeah. But there'll be an, there'll be a lot of tutors that, that they could find on tutor. Yeah, it's, I'm not the only coding person there. So if you, if I'm not open, you can just check out other people. There are a lot of other great tutors on the site. Tutor Ocean, don't forget, over there. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. I'm going to take a peek at Twitch. Yeah, so looks good. I asked all my questions. Is there a, anything else you'd like to talk about? Yeah, it's one small thing. I just found it pretty funny. Do you remember I mentioned so long ago about those? Yes. In 20, 2016, 2017, I told my dad to buy Dogecoin, a whole thousand dollars worth of Dogecoin, and he actually didn't want to do it. So that's quite funny. I just wanted to say that. It's just oh, that is hilarious. Yeah, I think we'll leave it there. But thank you so much, Kenji. You've been really helpful. I, you're helping out a lot of people who want to get into coding and they just don't know where to start. Your whole life story has just been inspiring. So it's really going to help out a lot of people. So I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you for thank you for the views for listening on Twitch and thank you to you too. So thanks for letting me be here. Thank you for listening to Learning Never Stops. And if you want more interviews with tutors, please subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts. Thank you and have a great day. Cameron, over and out.